COVID has affected us all, and with all the negativity surrounding it, it's often hard to find the positive. One of the blessings it has given us is the opportunity to build an avenue for creating change, starting right here in our community. Discussing topics that affect us most, such as racism in healthcare, maintaining a positive mindset, creating change, the importance of advocacy, and the many lessons we have all learned from COVID. If you or your organization are interested in speaking engagements, send a message to quadcast99 at gmail.com, reach out on Facebook at Quadcast, or online at drquadjo.ca. Welcome to Solving Healthcare. I'm Quadro Caramante. I'm an ICU and palliative care physician here in Ottawa and the founder of Resource Optimization Network. We are on a mission to transform healthcare in Canada. I'm going to talk with physicians, nurses, administrators, patients, and their families because inefficiencies, overwork, and overcrowding affects us all. I believe it's time for a better healthcare system that's more cost effective, dignified, and just for everyone involved. Ladies and gentlemen, Quadcast Nation, we are back in full effect. We brought another all star lineup. This is what we do. You ask, and we deliver. You guys were talking all this talk about reopening plants. Is it safe? Should we be concerned? So we decided to get the, the expert panel together. So guys, before we get introduce our panelists, whom you all know, they're, they're not new to the quadcast. I wanted to give uh, just a couple of shout outs in, uh, about some of our initiatives. Solving wellness. I'm so proud of this. If you type in SW into the tech chat box right now, you'll get all the information you need to sign up. And basically, you got your virtual yoga classes, fitness, nutrition, cooking classes with our own uh, Julia Hajar, uh, mindful meditation, ways to manage stress, sleep, all on one platform. It's all for healthcare professionals trying to reduce our burnout risks. And it's been kicking. We're up to 130 members. I'm so proud of this bad boy. $99 for the year, $9.99 per month. If you prefer, first month is free. Jump on it. SW in the chat, in the chat box, solvingwellness.com. If you want this live cast sent to you directly, go press news in the chat, chat box, N-E-W-S, and we will be able to uh, uh, serve that up to you. It's our newsletter, and you also get copies of the show. And lastly... Our latest initiative, which I'm really jazzed up about. So those that don't know, we, we started a, a charity called Bridges Over Barriers to, to really try and serve our underserved, underserviced youth within the community. And our latest initiative, which is part of the reason why we're here, actually, knowing that a lot of kids won't be able to participate in summer events. We called it 5K for 5K. So we're trying to raise $5,000 to try and support kids that want to participate in sports, summer camps, and so forth. And we'll be auctioning off, wait for it, a signed jersey from the one and only P.K. Subban. What? I miss him. P.K., you, you know what I'm saying? P, the foundation reached out. You should have seen me, by the <laughs> way, when, awesome. when I got that, that text. No, it was a call, actually. Wow. Talk about, like, taking off my shirt mid-clinic. It was just like, <laughs> this is real. Anyway, That's P.K., amazing. if you so happen to be listening to this, we love you. Thank you so much for... Uh, the donation. It means a lot. Okay. So, I mean, part of the reason we're here, I, I'm just going to do a quick uh, two second blurb on this. You know, I, I'll tell you full disclosure. I'm tired. I am tired. I'm exhausted at all of this, not only physically from all the demands and Tom, you could speak to this too, about how, what it's been like being in the ICU the last few uh, weeks to months, but the, this reaction within Ontario in terms of not only our schools, the reopening, the whole approach to this thing has been wearing. Like when you, we put in that hustle and then we get this message back that, you know, we're not going to follow the data. We're not going to listen to our concerns about our children. It, it is defeating. And today, I'm hoping at the end of this, we do have that positive energy, that light because these conversations that we have today, I think it helped dictate how things go in the future. And, uh, and you know, three of us honestly have that positive twist on things. And I hope that does dictate some of that dialogue. Anyways, 
That's my little rant. I feel like nobody here needs an introduction. We got Dr. Sumo Chakrabarty, infectious disease specialist. We got Dr. Tom Saris. I've lost track how many times y'all made the show. ICU doc, former director at Move 4 Hospital. Guys, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Great to be here. And oh I'm so happy brain. to be on with, with, with uh, Dr. Saris. I, I, I'm a huge fan of his. Uh, on uh, We, we uh, uh, follow each other on Twitter, and uh, it's, it's great to be on with you, man. And likewise, Suman, I, I'm a huge fan also. Huge fan. And one day I want to yeah. see you play the guitar. Okay. Yeah, you, you're going to be over at the end very soon. I, I love it. I love it. Suman, maybe I'll start with you because I think I've been actually quite proud of how how vocal you've been about the reopening strategy here in, in Ontario. And so maybe I'll leave it open. Like what, what were your thoughts when you saw that reopening plan? Yeah, I mean, the reopening plans, obviously, especially like, you know, in Ontario, we're starting tomorrow. Uh, wait, sorry, Friday, Friday, two days from now. And I think that uh, I was very honest from the beginning. I, we needed a reopening plan. We needed an exit strategy and we got it. And I was happy that was there. I'm happy we had something on paper. But I think that right from the very beginning, I thought this was excessively slow. I think it's overcautious. And the other thing that um, kind of, there's two other things that bother me is that um, stage one um, is stuff that you know we're, we're getting on Friday is stuff that should be open already. We know in the data that outdoor things are safe. You know, uh, you know, nobody's saying to have a massive um, Bruce Springsteen concert and filling the an open sky dome. No one's saying that, but I, I'm saying that you know, sports outdoors, uh, low risk retail, um, uh, uh, all these types of things I think can be done uh, at very low risk. The second thing that bothered me about this a lot, apart from the fact that it's slow, is that if you look at stage three is the final stage, there's still restrictions, right? And a lot of people haven't caught that. If you look at that, and that bothers me because, you know, there, I think, especially in Ontario, I get that there's trepidations about uh, opening, but I think that we've been kind of being led by fear. We're we're kind of uh, fearful of everything about going back to normal which is understandable, but we can't let that hold us back. And, you know, if you don't have a direct plan for, you know, a full reopening, then why are we doing any of this? Uh, absolutely. Tom, any thoughts when you, when you came across the uh, opening plans? Yeah. I mean, I, I think Sumat has said, um, you know, a lot of very important points. I think my, my, my avenue where I uh, come, come to this from is that I always like clear messaging. Um, and I think that what we can learn from uh, our approach in Ontario and uh, perhaps look at some other provinces is that, of course, during the pandemic, you have to learn how to pivot. Um, and, you know, the caveat here is I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm an ICU physician. But, but I also really understand the importance of messaging, especially in my job um, and consistent messaging. You can pivot, but you need a clear voice. Um, and you can't always be searching for uh, searching for answers all the time. Um, the other thing I would kind of say is that I think morality kind of played into this in a lot of uh, different ways. And I think one of the things that Suman said is, I'll explain how, you know, there's a lot of things in the data that we knew were a lot safer, right? So outdoors. Um, and a lot of us were kind of screaming outdoors, 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 outdoors. And, you know, anybody with, with any science background was looking at the outdoors and basically saying, you know, this is our ticket to get, um, you know, get buy-in from the public, right? And so what Suma, I think, just said basically was, there's a lot of things in stage one that are outdoors, for example, that could be possibly implemented earlier. And I think it's part of our mindset where we didn't make that kind of transition in our mindset to actually say, collectively as a society, outdoors is safe, you know, there's nothing that is 100% safe. I mean, there's nothing in the world is 100% safe. But as you've seen with a lot of demonstrations that have happened, with a lot of things, I mean, we've we've had this happen in the last month and everything is continually going down, right? These aren't indoor kind of get together. These are outdoors and in a, in a liberal, democratic, free society, people have the right to, to, to do that, whether we like it or not. Um, and and what we've seen is there's nothing, nothing has happened, right? Um, and I think one of those things is very important because uh, I think I think you get buy-in from people, and the key is getting buy-in from the public, so that it doesn't seem as though you're always kind of looking at the public and 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 using the stick, but more more just using a 
you know, using a, a common kind of common good community approach. And I think if we allowed people to do more of those things that were safe and accepted the small trade-offs that came from that, I think overall, this, the, you know, any, any pandemic approach would have been more successful. Man, you nailed that one, in my opinion. It, it, this was, um, in a ways, it was like, like such a missed opportunity, I thought, the outdoor transmission. And just for those that, you know, might be a bit new to the conversation, I'll frame it this way. Has any of you seen a case where you, you felt comfortably that you were like, this was related to an outdoor transmission? <laughs> that, that was a no from it's, it's yeah i too. mean like i and once again like i know tom like you can't be 100 percent certain or whatever sure, but sure. like but if you look at the the cases that we would see routinely indoor transmission congregate work environment at home uh with family multi-generational homes yeah and like it was how predictable was it and for us to be wait like wasting so much energy in terms of like you know, putting out a, in general a message about you need to be scared outside. Um, I think was it was a distraction. It was a waste. And what an opportunity! Imagine in the throes of of COVID, like as a leader, you could be like, "We're going to try and still stimulate the economy. We're still going to try and get that human connection, but let's just focus on doing it outside. Let's do that harm reduction. Let's give you guys hope." and really have that kind of focus, like what a missed opportunity. You know, I, I think, uh, I think we're creatures of habit, right. And, and there's so many things that I think, for example, outdoor business, outdoor, you know, markets, those kind of things that I know that um, I think Julia Marcus was talking about that in, in, mm. uh, in one of her. Um, she's amazing, by the way. Yeah, awesome. no, absolutely. And, and, you know, I, I read a lot of her stuff. I mean, the, the issue basically is, is that w- you know, we're creatures of habit and it's diff- difficult for us to, uh, to change huge parts of our society. But I think one of the things that really we missed, uh, in my opinion, is to really highlight, uh, as you said, outdoors, whether it's sports, whether or not it's kids, uh, you know, obviously, you know, I've heard from, you know, teachers that it's very hard to, to pivot to, to an outdoor learning environment for a lot of different things, but and I don't want to get too caught into that, but but really as an approach from from a societal approach that says, you know what, until we get the vaccines, because we know that they were coming, right? Let's really pivot to the outdoors, and 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 really tell people, you know what, you're going to be safe. Yes. Um, and and that's where I think you would have had a lot of buy-in because the more buy-in you have from your population, the more together a together feeling you have going forward, rather than you're always pushing a boulder and saying. What's next? You know, you don't mm-hmm. have to feel like you're so, you know, it's hard to do, but I think this is something that we can learn for the next time. Yeah. And I mean, I might push you a little bit though, Tom, about, uh, you know, like, yeah, there, it is hard for people to, you know, we are creatures of habit, but like, look at the amount of pivoting we've seen throughout this pandemic, small businesses, medicine, uh, like our medical community, like honestly, we're dinosaurs. The the amount of time typically it takes for us to adopt new approaches, usually it takes forever, and we did it. And uh, I don't know, like you know, like when I hear th- this ability to be like have that positive energy, we are going to have those outdoor markets, as you know, Julia Marcus is saying. Like this is and just have that positive energy and rally the community. I I think that. I actually think there would have been some bite. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna monopolize the Suman because I enjoy oh, listening ahead, to it more than. But but there's there, there there's one thing that I think is very very important. That's when people don't feel like they have an out, right? Yeah. That is yeah. where you start getting kind of this 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 burnout kind of phenomenon. This kind of helplessness feeling, right? And there's a lot of psychology literature to that, right? And so I think one day we were talking quadro. And we were saying, you know, there's there's only there's only two dimensions that I can live in, and that's indoors and outdoors. The only other third dimension is space. I don't have the money or the resources to go there, right? <laughs> so at some point, I, if I don't feel safe indoors and I don't feel safe outdoors, then that that's a kind of helplessness, right? And I think if we mm-hmm. kind of really kind of said, okay, look, we're gonna we're gonna accept the the small, you know, in some kind of format. Uh, trade-offs for for having some functions outdoors, right? Then I think we would have we would have had less of that kind of like burnout, helpless kind of feeling that I think a lot of people are feeling throughout the world, not just in Ontario or Canada. 
Yeah, f- fair enough. Like it, it, there needed to be some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I, I want to come back to to something that Suman said, and maybe we could elaborate a little bit on it too. Like, I, I'd actually never thought about this until you said it. At, um, it was about the third, whatever we call it, the third cycle third or stage. the third yeah. stage of, of yeah. the reopening. That there's actually not a we don't actually have a stage where it's completely mm-hmm. open. And uh, I guess what's the question? I guess the question is why? It, like, why is that? Like, what's preventing us from entertaining that? It's almost like is that just saying something about our decision makers, uh, our, our risk tolerance, saying like, you know, you know, it, there really isn't. We don't see that hope or of really being completely open. Like, what, what do you think? Why are we only limited to you know the? Why are we limited in our reopening steps? You know, I think that uh, what happened, uh, we, we saw our waves. I think, um, and I've said this before, is that you know, I think people, there's the messaging that happened uh, behind this, uh, on Twitter and things like that. It was a kind of a, a combination you see of emotion, of science and politics, right? But that emotion politics often kind of takes the, the top there. So a lot of people in Ontario think, number one, uh, you know, if, if those idiots, they, they just talk about the other, if those idiots would just listen, we'd be out of this. So there's this false sense mm. that, you know, we were in control of everything. So uh, that's the, you know, the essential worker bit, people didn't even know about that until like, you know, we, we were, we were screaming about it in October, but people didn't know about that until later on. Secondly, I think that, um, you know, when the waves happened, everybody thought that, uh, you know, this is all the incompetence of the government, right? But if you look around the world, like everyone kept talking about Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, right? What happened in Canada in our temperate climate was actually the rule around pretty much most of the, the developed world. It happened everywhere, multiple waves. Yeah, you could do things to, to mitigate the wave, but pretty much if before we started here, you knew in GTA, before the, the pandemic started, you could predict it would be bad here because of the structural factors, the you know factories, all concentrated, multi-generation homes, et cetera. So I, I think, uh, you know, well, putting all that together and, you know, I'll be honest with you, and, and, I, and I've talked to, to Quadro about this, the third wave took me by, by surprise. I figured it would happen, Right, the the, the variant uh, B117 was uh, replacing, but I thought it would be a smaller wave than it was. Fine, I, I was wrong, and and uh, I own that. But I think all those things together maybe made them a bit sh- uh, gun shy about making this, the the final recommendations about reopening. And I think you know doing it slow made sense. But now you know when you're looking on the ground, uh, what, what was it Las Vegas? I, I saw a really funny tweet today. La- yeah, I saw Vegas, Vegas like open hundred percent at midnight on Tuesday. <laughs> Vegas, <laughs> Vegas, Vegas, exactly, hundred percent on Tuesday. Yeah. And then some guy wrote above, "I get to buy socks on Friday in Ontario." <laughs> <laughs> I know I, I need some shoes. I can't buy shoes. But, but that, um, and, and one final thought about that is that I think that uh, like it's being led by fear. It's, it hasn't really been tweaked all that much. And the other thing is that the longer we wait to open, reopen things, this is why I worry about the slow aspect. The longer we wait, something's going to happen. You know, the Vietnam thing's going to, the Vietnam uh, variant that's around the corner is going to come. The, the, the second Indian variant we just heard about in the news today, that's going to come. And then people are just not going to want to open. Right. And that's why I think it's important for us to have a decisive opening in stages, do it and not draw it out too long. I like it. I like it. Any thoughts on that? Uh, well, yeah, I, I, you know, I think I think that uh, Suman brings some some great points. I mean, you know, again, I, I, I'm not an epidemiologist, but one of the things that I there's a there's a mathematician out of the UK, James Ward, that I'm starting yeah. to follow on, on on Twitter. And I think he has a very eloquent way of, 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 of putting facts in a manner. And we can talk about this later that. Uh, doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, freak out society, but at the same token is honest and fair in what he perceives is is what's going to happen. And I think that's hopefully what we all move towards as scientists or as medical practitioners or what have you. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm consciously trying to be that way. I'm not, definitely not perfect. And, and I, I try to learn from, from, my, from other people like himself. And one of the things that he'd mentioned, and he's, you know, he was modeling the UK and one of the things you know he modeled, if you look at it, is that if if they wait a little too long, then perhaps the fall wave is going to be bigger, right? And and I don't pretend to, um, you know, obviously this is I don't think anybody's arguing that this is also seasonal in temperate climates, um, and um, and so there there is some you know we have to we have to be honest about the fact that there's going to be there isn't going to be zero deaths, 
yeah. going forward, right? I mean, it, it is a pandemic. We just have to kind of choose um, wisely with regards to when we open things and and how long we wait, because because both has both have consequences potentially. One hundred percent. Like my biggest fear is not only the reasons that you mentioned the uh, concerns about uh, going too slow, but it's just also like the, the, the culture, the risk tolerance culture that it creates. Like it's just, it, it, it ex- ultimately we, we accept that we'll have this low risk culture. And what, what low risk does is it, it prevents progress. It prevents growth. It prevents like in, in the context of COVID con- human connection. It, 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 so much focus will be on the disease and you know, yes, we need to do all we can to mitigate it, but we also got to remember there's still mental health. There's still everything that lands in the ICU st- st- to this day, the traumas, the heart attacks, strokes, you know, like we still have to be, uh, look at things at a, at a holistic level. And so I, I really, that, that's what actually makes me more, more really anxious because especially, um, like I got a bit of slack when I was uh, back in January about, you know, we had this uh, mandate, I think, to mask on while people while people were skating yeah. or I think it was while they're playing hockey or whatever. And everyone's like, oh, why is it a big deal? And I'm like, because it's that extra layer of protection that for us to remove that. That's an extra layer. Like that's another prevention from from us getting back to normal with something that is like so low risk. Um, and so like, th- that's, that was my real concern about the slow reopening and, and sorry, go ahead, Tom. Well, so I think what's happened to people, um, and I think Dr. McBride talks about this actually is there's a, in my opinion, I think she's bang on on this, um, is there's a, there's a trauma kind of reaction going on, um, to a lot of people and different people react to a, a severe anxiety and trauma. I don't think anybody in this world has gone through, at least in a, a lot of, uh, Western societies has gone through that kind of real understanding that collectively we have a mortality facing us, right? As ICU physicians, um, and I'm sure in the, you know, in the ID world that you see Suman, you know, you know, it takes some time for us to kind of come to grips with the fact that, you know, we went to med school and we face our own mortality, right? That's why we all become hypochondriacs in the first one or two years. It's a, it's an actual process, right? I, I had a really tough time the first, first two years of residency with that. And, yeah. and, and, and then you just, you come to grips with that. Um, I don't think, that having a extra sterile kind of environment moving forward and having that kind of uh, the, exactly what you described so well is actually healthy for an environment. For many of the things that you mentioned, for progress, for everything, not to say that we don't have to be careful, but a lot of these risks were prevalent even before COVID, right? Like a lot of mm-hmm. risks we take every single day um, that, that we have absolutely no, no concept of, uh, and we just go about our daily lives. Right. And so I think, you know, if you parent in a kind of style, which it, which, you know, you try to prevent your kid from doing absolutely everything and not take that risk of climbing the scaffold or not taking that risk of whatever, then child psychologists will tell you, you know, what will happen in that kind of context, right? So there has to be a balance. And I think the same thing happens in, in, with us, uh, we have to come to a, some some call it a you know there's there's um uh there's a CEO out of the NHS uh, um, who who basically had a very good thread in my opinion and was very very candid and 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 he was the CEO of the uh, I think Hobson is his last name C- CEO of the NHS providers in a 25 tweet uh, thread the other day which I thought was actually brilliant because it was so honest and in that he mentioned what a lot of people are are are, are saying to me also which is. You know, you know, COVID's going to be around, um, and we're going to have to ask some very difficult societal questions. Perhaps I'm paraphrasing here, which is what is our acceptable morbidity and mortality? We've set kind of like an un- unconscious morbidity and mortality a- a- acceptance, whether or not it's conscious or unconscious, with the flu. We all know every year in November, December, January, February rolls around. You know, in our temperate climates, we accept a certain amount of societal morbidity and mortality right and that's what our hospital systems are are based on we never go through a flu year where nobody uh you know passes away or dies um in this kind of context right but but the question is you know can we afford to to let's say if there's more variants and more variants, i mean you know, i don't want to talk about variants all the time but you know we can't do this every single year going forward right mm-hmm. uh, there is a there is a quality of life as an icu physician palliative care physician you talk about we have to start talking about these things 
I think. And that's at the core what's missing throughout all these things. It's kind of like a taboo subject, but we never talk about quantity of life in the ICU, right? We mm-hmm. talk about quality of life. And so mm-hmm. we're kind of stuck in this quantity of life and that's okay for three to six months, maybe nine months, maybe a year, but now we're starting to get into 15 and 16 months. And so at some point we're going to have to have this kind of, you know, this conversation about, you know, what are the, what are the, the acceptable trade-offs? Yeah. Like, are you going to ride a bus? Are you going to be able to go in your car? Actually, the best example you, I don't know if you remember this. I'm sure you remember this. The mal- childhood malaria example. That was you, right, uh, Tom? I don't maybe not. I, I'm, I don't, okay. I don't just take credit for that. that. That's a good, it sounds like a good, good quote. You sure, yeah, yeah, of course. But yeah. Basically what you, what you told me, or someone told I gotta me. I got to learn from you, Suman. <laughs> but what, what you said, what they said is like child, like with, with, with malaria internationally, there's like a death. Every oh yeah. 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 No, we were talking hour. about this. Yeah. 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 That was you. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. Every couple of minutes a there's a child under five that, yeah. Yeah. In the world. And yeah. You know, and, I mean, I, you want to say, do you want, just, actually, yeah. Why don't you. Uh, smoking is another thing. I, I think I mentioned it on, on, on one of the podcasts we were talking about, we collectively as a society accept, you know, 35 to 45,000 deaths per year, smoking related in Canada. Yeah, you know? but no, the and, malaria and, and, one is... And we tax that, right? And we benefit from a society. We benefit as a society. But, you know, if somebody were to say, oh, by the way, and this is from the Lung Association, right? This isn't me saying it, right? Um, it, you can Google it right now. And if 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 somebody were to say to you, there's 40,000 Canadian deaths per year, okay? I, I can be corrected on the number, plus or minus, but it's, but it's there. Um, you know, I'm not a stat sheet. But at the end of the day, if we were going to say, you know what? You know, but we're, we actually tax that, right? Think about that for a second. We tax that, we make money, Off people buying cigarettes. and we use that money, and we know that people are dying because of it. Right. And we're okay with it. Yeah. Nobody virtue and signals about that anymore. That's true. Not, yeah. like, we are okay with it. We, we don't like it. We, we try to get people off of it, and we many of us have spent hours, right? And I respect the fact that it's an addiction. Um, but at the same token, as a collectively as a society, we're a little bit... Uh, discongruent with where we put our morality oh, yeah. plays sometimes, right? COVID proved that. Yeah. COVID but, proved that for sure. Absolutely. But it, the, I, I still think the malaria okay, one was yeah, a, tell, a tell good us example. So basically, yes. Yeah, so, okay. So basically a child dies every, uh, what was it? Yeah, I don't know, but, but, okay, but, we'll but, but it's a very it's uncomfortable just, stat. Yeah. It's a it's very a child dies stat. every hour from malaria. If we wanted to solve this problem, in some of these nations, Saharan Africa, so up. forth, you can, we could, we could put in a curfew. You could say anytime after, yeah. a, right. you know, eight o'clock, nobody's outside. That's exactly what we were talking about. It's about two months ago. We yeah. Were about that. yeah, yeah, it's like last week. Like, a, a, like, a, <laughs> basically, yeah, you put in a quarantine in all these areas, and children will live potentially, but no one's doing that because. This is not their values. There is a value of being able to connect, to live. This, and so you accept a certain le- level of morbidity and mortality. And it, that might sound harsh, but this is what the this is what we do in this world. You know, we accept a certain amount of risk to live. You know what I'm saying? And this is a I, I hate to say it, it's a taboo to- topic when it comes to COVID. You know what I'm if saying? If I can jump off that for a second, uh, Quadro, you know, I, I yeah. talked to uh, you before about um, the simple thing of the case number. Right. And uh, the, the case number, um, all the stats. And I think that one of the problems here is and this guy actually this is probably uh, Tom, by the way, your your pilot um, analogy here. But I talk about like these numbers, these raw numbers, these variants it being direct to consumer advertising. It's, it's, it's analogous. It's like this raw stuff is coming into the public. Right. Um, now social media has the same volume as our experts. And, you know, sometimes I, I, I've been critical of the messaging of, of, of our experts, uh, our, our authorities, the, the provincial, federal. I, I've been critical of that. And the problem is that you have all this information. And, you know, for example, um, measles outbreaks, we kept track of that. Um, uh, gonorrhea, I, I know it sounds funny, but there's a, there's a super resistant gonorrhea that's going around the States and it's coming to Canada. It's not something we post every day on, on the news, right? But it's there and the docs and the ID docs, the epidemiologists, we all look at it and we adjust our practice based on it. Right now, all this information is going straight to the consumer without any processing, right? And I bet you right mm. now, if we stop that GD, I don't think I can swear on this, but the, the friggin' case count, 
you would see the temperature mm-hmm. would drop of, 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 of the site. Everything would drop. The variance, okay, I get it. We have to be careful. But you know, do, does everybody really, really need to know every single time a variant arises? We know variants arise as ID docs, but when you talk about it, they th- people think of the X-Men, right? Mm-hmm. That, oh, something's mutated. It's now worse and we're all going to die. So uh, I think sometimes it, uh, in, information can be too much, especially um, information that's not uh, processed. And then, you know, you get these really weird um, contradictions and cognitive dissonance akin to what you were saying, Tom, about the smoking, about the malaria, and there's trade-offs. And we haven't had that. I don't think we still have had that trade-off discussion, to be honest with you, because, you know, right now in Ontario, at least, we're still talking about, you know, um, we're, they were opening too quickly. And I'm like... Partly, that, that's not a safe space, right? Like that trade-off discussion, I mean, we, we have those very uncomfortable discussions with families um, and with patients every single day. I mean, I've been practicing as an ICU physician for 20 years. There isn't a day or uh, definitely not a week that goes by that I don't have really uncomfortable discussions with people, right? And I think sometimes we take for granted how hard that is for a lot of people, right? And I think that, you know, we don't, we don't live in a society where, where we... Um, where we accept or where we don't live in a society where death is something that we talk about too, right. As a natural kind of phenomenon, we, you know, we collectively do everything to try and prevent it at all. I mean, you know, everything, right. I and mean, we don't talk about these things very often. So these are hard things for people to talk about. One of the things that I wanted to, 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 to mention with, uh, with, with what you said, Suman is the whole kind of responsibility for direct to consumer, uh, that, that, you, that, that you coined right now. And I think that's very important because, because, you know, we all went through the scientific method, you know, since, you know, high school. And then we went to, you know, we did our undergrad. A lot of us did it in, a, you know, I have a BA, BSc. So combined and, and, you know, there's a, there's a lot of it learning the, the scientific method. And then you go in, you realize that a lot of things that, that you learn in, in medicine and science uh, you know, it kind of, it disappoints you because afterwards you realize six months later that, well, in fact, it wasn't, the, the, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't true. This, this antibiotic that you thought worked, for example, just doesn't work as well as you thought it did. You know, uh, Zygris in, uh, in just to get a little technical, obviously with sepsis, I was using it for a long time. And then all of a sudden we realized that it didn't work. And this is a natural phenomenon. $10,000 drug, oh. too, by the way. Yeah, yeah, no, no. But this is a natural phenomenon that we go through as, as medical practitioners, as a scientist. And I, I don't think that the, for, you know, for a large part, I don't think the public kind of sees that. So a lot of times when, when science is evolving and we put it right out there on Twitter all the time and we commented and we argue, this is what we do in, this is what we do in journal club yeah. all the time. We argue on Journal Club. When we do it face to face with some good Greek souvlaki, it's not a problem. We all get along just fine, right? No, I'm being serious. Like we could argue, you know, until the tzatziki is all gone. And you know what ends up happening? Everybody goes home yes. happy. But on Twitter, this social media thing, which I want to get into at some point, the social media, you know, AI algorithms, everything is really making everything tribal, including our scientific discussions, right? I mean, this isn't isn't any news to anybody, but I don't think anybody's really paying attention to this. The same people that drive me nuts, perhaps on Twitter, and and I'm becoming, I'm trying to become a better person and just like, you know, it's okay, you know, we were having different different, uh, views on things. In real life, if we weren't in this lockdown stuff and we had face-to-face discussions with people, you would see that we would come to perhaps not a hundred percent agreement, but we would like, you know, say, Hey, how's it going? Maybe we can have a beer, you know, one of these days, you know, this is the kind of stuff that's important. And, you know, we didn't evolve to be on computers all the time. Right. We evolved through like millions and millions of years for unsaid kind of things. Right. Where we kind of look at each other and there's that there's, it's not just written in 280 characters or whatever Twitter is right now. There's the, there's the, the, there's the nuances. There's the little facial expressions. Those are the things that are important. And those are, that's what I'd like to see science come back to. And at the end of the day, I think if we stick to a social media platform that goes direct to consumer and then goes out in the world and everybody sees us arguing, they really think that we don't know what we're doing. Yeah. They say, well, you know, you got Saris here, you got, you know, Chakrabarti, you've got, you know, this person here, they don't agree with it. So why, why do I believe anything? But that is the scientific process. That is yeah. science. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things to, uh, I mean, because I will say there was a lot of value to Twitter when it came to this pandemic medically. Like, I think the agility for us to um, 
you know, acquire knowledge relatively rapidly, have those discussions about, hey, man, we're using these steroids and they seem to be working well. Hey, we're starting to delay our intubations now and start that dialogue. Like there was a benefit there. But that you're right, this the algorithmic tribalism, like the, the fact that that is is um, is basically like adopted is it was it was dangerous it was it was horrible um and it just led to this I, i'm reading this book by adam grant i keep going back to it but we as a society we in general we should be learning to not associate our opinions with our identities right then somehow we totally had our identities like tied up with our opinions if it was masking schools and you know don't get me wrong i'm 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 not better than anybody else like i'm victim to this too but if we the thing about having that face-to-face interaction as tom was alluding to is that you're more inclined to stick with your values i think you know you because you're having more authentic conversation you're you see that person eye to eye you could more likely to find some common ground um but holy cow that the 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 identity piece being tied to uh, an opinion was vicious. And like, I got to say, you know, I've got pretty thick skin, but the amount of heat <laughs> you get for like defending yeah. kids, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I, it's a, like, I just end up muting a bunch of people, but it's like, what the hell is happening? I'm talking about kids. You know what I mean? If you can't ch- stick up for kids, I don't know what the hell. And the other point, just before I forget, the data, I, I, I can't emphasize how important that point is, Suman, about the data dumping on all the consumers. And so, like, it's dangerous, actually. I would argue that it's actually dangerous when you, it's like, if you don't have the, 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 if the data comes to you and you don't know how to interpret it, like, people come to me and be like, for example, remember during uh, the, the, the kids out of school in January and people are like, man, but did you see the kids percent positivity? Yeah. Did you see that? It was doubled than what it used to be. I'm like, damn straight is doubled. It should be doubled. Who's getting tested right now? You mean, if you don't have to go to school, you're only getting tested. If the apocalypse is happening, yo, like, yes, that makes sense. And like, you have that skill. The, the denominator that got smaller. That, that's what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. That's a, that's a even more, a more eloquent way to say that. But like, Man, and then the thing is, people will make these decisions. People that uh, are are pushed to make the decisions based on these numbers that come through, and there's dangerous outcomes, like schools, for example. Well, all the negativity that's happening through these school closures, I'm going to say it again, while anytime I have an audience, child abuse, their mental illness, their physical well-being, their overall well-being, um, making the margins larger for those that, for the haves and the have-nots, it's, um, like, it's, it's, tremendous the amount of uh uh like negativity that comes through not having our schools open but like this is based on people interpreting the data that shouldn't be interpreting the data i I just wanted to say that uh, you're you're a guy that that was one of the most politically charged uh conversations um one thing that i learned um so you know I, i think that for us in medicine uh we you know scientific objectivity, the, the search for the truth, that's something that generally drives us. Um, I'm not used to the political discussions. I'm not used to the, um, uh, you know, the, the trolling and all that kind of stuff. So um, I agree with you that I, I, I had to, I had to, <laughs> nice, you changed? Get, get I'm too hot, eh? It's getting, more, it's getting more hot. Too. I'll, I'll tell you I'm my story too. later. We had our AC fixed. Today. Oh, amazing. Uh, I, I was just saying that uh, like it's, <laughs> um, it's tough. And I think I had to really get uh, um, used to why does this person keep saying that same thing over and over again, even the evidence is showing this. And then I realized that, you know, there's political agendas, there's troll agendas, there's, it it was just, it's just a messy situation where it's not, not the most conducive for a good scientific discussion. Uh, Yeah. And, and kids in schools, like, yeah, like there are situations where, yeah, maybe a school does uh, at the very, very height of community transmission, it can, contributes a little bit but it was just weird to see that wow like this data is showing this and you just want to keep them out i don't know i, I was i'm with you quadra that really frustrated me so the, the the other thing i just want to uh just there's two things i want to mention and one of them is is this i want to talk about this tribalism a little bit because you're starting to see it 
uh, even even in any kind of platform where you can have on Twitter. And and look, I'm a bit of a hypocrite by saying this because I, I jumped on, you know, because I strongly believed in, you know, children's rights and children's right to an education in the context. So so obviously I'm I, you know, I, I fall I fall victim to this, too. Right. But I, I'm, I'm trying to, 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 to learn in this atmosphere. But the problem with this is that we're a lot of us and I've talked to Quadro about this. A lot of us now are looking at our own four walls right? Instead of looking at the broader concept, if I'm an ICU physician, you know, all of a sudden, if I'm on Twitter, or if I'm on some type of platform, if I make a statement that I'm trying to protect my, my turf, so to speak, we see this regionally, we see this within cities, we see this provincially, we see this with the Atlantic bubble. You know, we used to have a globalized kind of view, hopefully, I mean, as big as it could get, right? But now we're kind of like, shrinking what, what, what defines us, Right. And COVID and and social media have have really kind of added to that energy of kind of looking at our four walls, looking at our profession, trying to protect what kind of rights we have within our profession, trying to protect our ICU capacity, trying to protect whatever we have, uh, our capabilities, what, what we what we can do. But sometimes when we do that, people then latch on to it. Right. And then your identity becomes a part of that. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that doesn't happen, that happens is then, then I find, and myself too, you know, I think we lose track of all the other things that we used to care about, right? And that's where we're not able to do the trade-offs. You know, even if, for example, my, you know, our ICU is, you know, kept at 95% and it, it comes at the expense of a whole bunch of other things, we should be able to have that conversation, Right. But I think we're siloing ourselves. And and I, I don't think that's a good thing, because at the end of the day, we're all human. We all have the same you know, we all have very similar needs. Right. Maslow's hierarchy, you know, and 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 we kind of have to kind of a, a, adopt kind of address problems in that kind of philosophical manner. I don't think we can look at it as like, you know, there's a good there's a there's a good reason that unions exist. There's a good reason why our Ontario Medical Association exists. Right. Because they they, they, they have a fundamental uh, uh, a fundamental reason for being in society. But when we look at huge global problems like covid, we have to keep that in mind as physicians uh, to our medical association and so forth. But at the same token, we also have to look broader than that. Uh, yeah, I, you know, yeah, what I mean? It, a hundred percent. I mean, even a good example, I think Suman and Zane were bringing this up too, in terms of literally globalization from a, a COVID uh, approach was, was vaccines was like, you know, you wanted to make sure, you know, other areas of the world were getting vaccinated or having access to vaccines because it affects us all to, uh, directly. Like w- when it comes to variants, uh developing and so forth like we need to be thinking outside of not only our city county province country but what's happening globally like the you know this the threat of the indian variant was a direct result of under vaccinations if uh, i might be speaking out of like you know once again i ain't the i'm immunologist uh id doc but from what you guys are telling me um so yeah, I, I do think we we did become a we this did breed a little bit more selfishness uh, of this whole crazy uh, pandemic, but but yeah, it's a great point that if we were going to get through a lot of these things, we do need to think of things more at a high level, if you if you will. Can I add one thing here, um, Quadro? You know how uh, we talked about, um, I think that whether you're infectious disease or not, you know that uh, the the risk trade-off, blah, blah, blah. You also know that uh, COVID is something that you're never going to eliminate, right? Uh, And I mean that both like figuratively as well as in the scientific sense. Um, And it's, it's interesting that at least in Ontario, what I'm seeing is all of the efforts, all of the, the discussion you're seeing on Twitter is all based on elimination, right? Uh, um, you know, we shouldn't let those kids play basketball. You know, what happens if one of them uh, breeds on the other one outside? You know, they're going to get COVID, right? Um, and it, it's easy for me to say, well, okay, look, um, 
it's heavy prolonged indoor exposure with a huge viral inoculum, which is resulting in um, young people getting sick and coming to the ICU. You guys saw it, I saw it. Uh, but I think that um, obviously the public doesn't see it. And, you know, uh, I remember last summer uh, when Teresa Tam was saying um, that, uh, look, I know you're young, but like you shouldn't, uh, you guys shouldn't party because young people can die of COVID too. When I heard that, I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Like, uh, you know, that that's, I think when we moved from uh, something that to, to flatten the curve, to kind of uh, help save our hospital system to nobody should get COVID. Uh, and then when that started clearing, uh, is it okay? If you get even get mild COVID, you can have long COVID. Even the long COVID, we haven't actually characterized it very well. It's, it's actually thankfully very rare. And now you, we're actually sowing, so we're reaping what we sowed because nobody wants to open up because everybody's afraid of a single. Um, we have we have the most miraculous vaccines in the history of mankind in our arms. 70% of eligible uh, Americans, Ontarians have been vaccinated and we're still worried about opening up, right? This is what happens with bad messaging. And I don't blame people for thinking that. I'm just saying when we don't message our um, points well, this is what happens. No, I think one of the things, and, and, and uh, you know, I think one of the things and I'm going to piggyback on what Suman is saying with regards to, to I think, uh, is also intellectual scientific honesty in the context of, I think the more honest we are with our messaging to say, listen, we are worried about young people spreading this virus. We are worried that it's going to get, you know, in those color charts into, uh, uh, you know, higher risk, uh, more elderly uh, population. We are worried about that. However, these are the stats as we know them for 20 to 30 year olds. Right. And, and I think when you're intellectually honest with the public in the long term, you gain. Right. And the the, the, the sometimes I mean, th this is happening throughout the world is that it's it, I, I can predict the messaging throughout you know, the world politically based upon what is your desired scientific outcome. If you want young people to get vaccinated, for example, you can almost predict what's going to what's going to be said. And it's not like people right. are trying to engineer it. Right. I'm not saying that, but sometimes you look at the data and you forget to finish the sentence of the data. For example, when when I'll give you an example, when when we heard that a lot of younger people were ending up in our ICU. OK, it's almost an you know, we, we talk about it all the time as ICU physicians. It's almost like the you know, the, the virus, the you know, COVID, you know SARS-CoV-2 took a pivot and said, you know what? The way it was messaged. Right. This is the way I heard it was it's not hitting. Uh, older people anymore or the elderly, the virus just decided to just boom, hit 40 year olds all of a sudden. That's what it did. But obviously the virus didn't do that. What happened was you were talking about denominators and num numerators. You have a certain fraction of people, whether or not it's more virulent or not, we can argue 1.2, 1.5, 1.0, .1 it isn't. But really what happened on a population level, you had vaccination of certain age groups and then what ended up happening is you had a lot of infection in a, in, a, in a community. Who spreads it the most in that kind of context is essential workers, younger people, you know, the, and because of natural societal kind of flow. Um, and, and then we started seeing the numerators pop up, right? Because if you're going to have a fraction, if your denominator goes up, your numerator is going to go up because the fraction has to stay the same, right? And so we started seeing people in their 40s in the ICU but but the reality is, is there was a lot more infection going around and we started seeing that. And I think the messaging should have been, look, we have a lot of infection, which means that at the end of the day, it's you're, you're, the law of averages means that you're going to have a, a significant amount of people that end up in the ICU. But I think what a lot of people heard, a lot of friends calling me up, a lot of friends of mine are calling me up who are not in the scientific realm, were saying, well, what's happening? Like, is this virus now going to kill my child? Is it going to hurt my you know, my 25-year-old who's in, you know, I got to call it in university. But at the end of the day, you know, people don't look at the fractions and they don't kind of think about it that way. But what they hear is, is this, this virus has now made a pivot and it's going after young people, right? And, and I think we have to be intellectually honest and in saying, well, of course, it's going to still, it still has an 8,000-fold difference between the youngest and the oldest of our population. I think it's 8,700, right? As far as mortality is concerned. 
that doesn't diminish the fact that there's going to be tragedies because those happen, right? I don't want to diminish that. But we can't live our lives on minimal kind of risk all the time. I, I tell, and I think that's I think that's what you're getting at too. Yeah. You know? sure you don't have any epidemiologists? You're, you're pretty good at this, man. This is, that, that, was, that was impressive. I was actually I agree with you. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of an MPH, but but yeah. but but here, but but honestly, this is this is this is how I this is how I feel. And I think that it has short-term benefits, right? Because you get people, perhaps, perhaps you may get a few more people vaccinated if if the messaging stays like that. And I honestly think people are really trying their best in messaging this. But I think as, as, as scientists and as clinicians, we have to talk about being as intellectually honest, which means you're not trying to be dishonest, I don't think. I don't think anybody's trying to be dishonest. I really don't. I just think we have to be able to finish that sentence, Love it. right? Why are younger people ending up in the ICU? Well, there's a scientific reason for that. The virus didn't change so that all of a sudden there's thousands of people in the ICU. That didn't happen. This was honestly, Tom. I think it was leadership, man. I thought I think it was started from the top where the anthem was it's going to be fear based messages, like honestly, because like when you like we these are smart people that are that are sitting at these tables, right? Like that know the data and and they're not they're not stupid. They see the same data that we do, but you know, and this might be this is me like uh editorializing this a bit but when you're messaging out when you know the uh, as you as you mentioned like this is math denominator your in your numerator and you're still gonna pump out that message you should be you should be scared as a 28 year old of covid and this is the reasons why that's that's because you are having that approach deciding that this is going to be a fear-based approach so that I'm going to convince you to stay at home, convince you to get your vaccine. You know what I'm saying? As a, as opposed to empowering you and being, having that honest dialogue saying, yo, like, yes, we're seeing some younger patients. This is why we're th- seeing it. We are going to get through this. It's still important to get vaccinated for these reasons, but no, we wanted, we wanted to have that anthem of fear. And uh, I just, from my perspective it's not a great like it's never been a public health approach you know until, as far as i know that has been effective period it, it worked for it worked for like sti just telling people not to have sex don't have sex <laughs> and then and then the, the, yeah. it, it'll work your ding dong will explode yeah well and no, we talk but, about that all the time with smoking yeah. cessation right mm-hmm. yeah i remember i remember one one uh one one test that we had you know those uh those uh, simulated patient tests, you know, and I was, uh, I was uh, young and, you know, just in med school for my second year. And I think I had one of those OSCEs and, you know, I had to, I had to tell somebody that, uh, you know, I had to counsel somebody on, on, on how to quit smoking and man, did I ever get it wrong? When I got the feedback from that, I was like, look, your, your dad died of lung cancer. Like, I mean, it was, it, I didn't realize it, but I was doing fear-based messaging. I learned so much from that OSCE because you know, the doctor sat me down afterwards, says, if you think you're going to change anybody's mind, I still remember this, it was at the general, says, do you think you're going to change anybody's mind by you saying that? It's impossible. I hear you. <laughs> was that? No, we're, we're just, uh, he's got a celebration. That, I don't, <laughs> El, Dor- El Dorado. I have a bit of a headache, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm having just a little bit of apple cider. There you go. There you go. I got, here, here's a question for, for whoever wants to take it first. Like, What's your opinion, like straight up, of what's going down on in the states? Like seriously, like where you are, like when it comes to the reopening strategy, where they're like, you know what, we're gonna swing, man. We're gonna swing for the fence. We're gonna be like, you know, we got once again. You're in Las Vegas, feel that stadium. Ugh. You're in Texas, feel that stadium with the uh, with with people. Are you like, what do you think of it in general? What do you think is going to happen? Do you think there are going to be consequences of them opening too quickly? Uh, and I've been asked this question twice today, actually, on media. So I'm <laughs> curious to hear how you would how you would handle it. Actually, I'll start with Suman because uh, he's the most media trained individual. Here's the one thing on media. The one thing I learned: don't move your eyebrows too much when you talk, and then you don't seem shady. You can say whatever you want, and you don't seem shady. <laughs> I learned this. I'm, I'm serious. Um, I um, so <laughs> you, you think about that now. Uh, <laughs> 
That's all I'm going to so, think about. So uh, yeah, <laughs> here's the one thing that I think that's important about the states. And uh, obviously, there's a lot of politicization uh, going on with when uh, um, Trump was in office, even now. But the thing is, is that there's a tendency for us in Canada to kind of like sit in our high horse and think, ha we're better than the state. Ha, ha, ha. But the thing is that the, the, the truth is that they had this ridiculously good vaccination campaign. It's, you know, we're doing great now, but let's give credit where credit's due. At one point they were doing a million, didn't they do a 4 million a day at one point? Am I, am I right? They, they, they actually peaked at five, 500. 5 million a day. Which yeah. is, so yeah. good for them. Yeah, it's, it's petering off. But the point is, I think that, yeah, they have gone all in, especially in the southern states. And I think that everybody wants to say, you know what, they're just going to get screwed. Something's going to happen. And maybe that's right. Maybe that's right. But I do think that what's happened is that they're having confidence in the vaccine. They do have a lot more hospital capacity per capita than we do. I mean, you guys can tell me that way better than I can. But um, we had... Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. We had a crisis on Ontario or getting to a crisis after we passed 500 or whatever um, ICU beds. And there's like a thousand ICU beds just in Miami alone. Right? Am, am I right about that? Close mm-hmm. to that? Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, the, the Miami numbers, like, I think there's how many? There's like a million. People? Yeah, it's not that many. People. Actually, I don't know. Yeah, there's not that well, many not people that many in Miami. Trump. And yeah, but the the population per ICU bed is ridiculous, that ratio. There's a, there's a lot more ICU beds. I was just trying to look at the, the, the ICU capacity. Um, and, and hopefully we, we uh, I want to stick to the, the, the theme of the, that what Suman's talking about, but hopefully we can talk about ICU capacity because that's one of the things that we have to think about long-term. Yeah, and, and I, I think that like you know, seeing that, yes, they've gone all in. Places like Vegas went all, all in, right? And I don't think that necessarily means that they're going to have this like reflexive thing and they're going to have Armageddon. The other thing is, yeah, I do think that naturally there likely will be a bit of a rebound in cases, but let's also have some faith in the vaccine. The vaccines are worth working tremendously well, anything that's going to happen will be attenuated and they'll deal with it. Right. And that's the thing about uh, that type of mindset is that we'll deal with it when it comes in, in a way that I think that that's their trade-off. They've made that trade-off and I'm jealous. Like I've been watching hockey and the Colorado Vegas game. It's been amazing, you know, watching that. So, you know, I think, I think what I, what I would say to, to this, so Suman's going to change into a Vegas Jersey. Oh no. Okay. Good. I just had a big okay. sneeze. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one of the things that I wanted to say basically for on, 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 on this thing is that I think there's no one size fits all for society. And I think, I think your society will, will, let, will, will guide a lot of the kind of principles and values that you make your decision on. So if you go into, you know, the US, there's some, you know, there's some uh, license plates that, you know, live free or die, right? I mean, there's a, there's liberty and freedom, I think, in the US uh, and risk taking, even in corporate risk taking, even in you know economies. I mean, you look at Wall, Wall, Wall Street, right? I mean, the, the, you know, part of the whole uh, you know psyche of, of 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 being American in a lot of areas, perhaps not all. And we can talk about the regionalization difference of California. San Francisco is a very good example of that. That that's very different than than a Texan or a or a, or a Floridian approach. But that's part of their societal values, right? So they will, they are bigger risk takers than we are, you know, here in, in, in Ontario. They're bigger risk takers than, than, than we are in, in the Maritimes. That is, that is who they are as a people. And I think, I think Suman said it very well, that, that if you kind of look at that and, and kind of moralize that sometimes and say as a Canadian, you know, we love doing this as Canadians, by the way, right? And and this is something that I used to do too. And I'm I'm, stri- I'm trying not to do that because there's a lot that we can learn from other countries, especially the U the U S. and that kind of, you know, if I, I don't think it's right for us to look at the states and say, well, look at look 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 at look at what they did. They they don't care about their population. You know, morals are are relative. They're not absolute, right? And what you value is a is a very is a very relative thing, right? And so there's a lot of people in the U S. that say. You know, these are my rules for 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 being alive, and I will take this much. So I don't think governments could, you know, after after you get forty eight percent, you know, vaccination, double vax, fifty percent, you know, you know, they're at like fifty one, fifty two percent single vaxed, and you know, double vax, they're they're a huge, a great campaign. I don't think you can go to their society as a CDC and not have guidance. For example, I think Canadians are more tolerant 
uh, oh, sorry, less risk tolerant. And that's who we are as, as, as people. I mean, we can go back historically to 200 years ago and, and why the two nations were made, right? Really? Like, you know, like we are a less risk, we are, uh, we are more risk averse society. And there are also regional differences, even within my own city, right? If I, if I go outside right now, I won't name any neighborhoods, but if I go outside right now and, and I walk in certain parts of Ottawa, there is 1% outdoor masquerade. I'm talking about in parks, like, I'm not talking people people being this close together. I'm talking about just normal kind of just walking walking around. And if you go into certain neighborhoods, that changes to like 40% or 50%, right? This happens, I'm sure, in Toronto. This happens, I'm sure, in London. And this happens in, you know, Sarnia. This happens in Sudbury, right? It happens everywhere across Ontario. And I'm sure it happens in BC and, and parts of Quebec too. Um, but I think at the end of the day, I think society will only give you so much and, and you have to read your society well. And that's where I think we're at in, in, in Canada right now, right? We're kind of, we've kind of, we're kind of, we got a little bit more in the tank kind of thing, right? Yeah. And I mean, what I just hope we just look at the data objectively. Like, I mean, I think this is something we've missed this whole pandemic, you know, really focus on letting the data dictate our actions. But I, I just hope we learn from it. Like if we do see that, you know, our colleagues, our uh, our brothers down south are are doing okay with a more aggr- aggressive approach. That tells us something. Like I think that for some reason we 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 really think we're unique. Uh, Tom said it really well uh, in a tweet. He was like, "Do do do kids in Ontario sneeze different?" Oh yeah, I, I was oh, I was just thinking, I'm trying to get the feeling that kids in Ontario sneeze. A lot more than the rest of the world. <laughs> I, I I love yeah. that. I, mean, I love that. Yeah, I mean, but the funny I mean, thing is, I was just I was actually in the ICU. I was taking like a ten minute break because I was just it was a really busy morning, and I just sat there. I'm just like, okay, I just need five minutes with myself. For some reason, I go on Twitter when I need to take a break. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, well, what everybody, am I doing? Everybody. I should be meditating. Anyways, yeah, that's everybody. But it's like you, you know, it's funny, like. You know, I think uh, I've seen someone comment on this, like how we've just moralized our responses. Like, you know, it's you're a bad person if you do if you do X, Y, Z and we're, we're you're a good person if you do A, B, C. It's it, once again, it's just like we we put too much values on people's opinions. It's it's been it's a re- been a real detrimental aspect, I think, of 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 COVID in general. Yeah, I mean, um, so uh, in in the last uh, wave, I especially um, was getting people's stories. The last two waves, I would say, second, and third, and I think that uh, in my experience with contact tracing, is that you know people do, doing contact tracing, they're oftentimes leading you down the garden path because they're afraid of telling you. And one thing that I would always tell people that look, you got COVID, and I'm going to take care of you, but you got a virus. A virus's job is to infect you. And even if, I I even tell them, even if you did go to a gathering, I don't want you to think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I know that you you, you expose yourself. The point is, is that you're doing something that's normal for us. It's not normal for humans to not interact for, with their parents for 10 months. Right. And that that's tough. So then as time went on, and I mentioned at the start of this podcast that, you know, the, the narrative remained. If those idiots would just listen, we would be okay. I heard that line so many times. Idiots, listen. Idiots, listen. Look at what happened at HomeSense. Look at Trinity Bellwoods. And it's interesting, a couple of things came out that the moralization of COVID started kind of uh, galvanizing. So if somebody, you know the whole skating thing? We, we just talked about that, right? I would rather have a hundred people skating outside than 10, those people in groups of 10 watching TV indoors. Right. And hundred percent, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. hundred percent. The reason is it's, it's almost like we became Puritans that if somebody is doing something leisurely, that, that means that there, that that, that it's, there's something wrong with that. Right. And uh, you, I I put the tweet out today. There's a party in one of the parks in Toronto. It was actually kind of cool looking. I, I, I kind of wish I were there. I get it. You know, there's, there's people shouldn't be hanging out right now. It's it was stay at home order, but like that looked amazing. And you got people that have locked down for over a year, over a year. They have no safe alternatives. Uh, as Tom mentioned, you're not safe indoors. You're not safe outdoors. What do you expect they're going to do? 
right? Canada Day, people, well, not Canada Day, uh, uh, Victoria Day, they're firing firecrackers at each other. And he's like, that's mm. not right. But you have all these people with all this pent up energy with nothing to do. And that's why this is where we are right now. And uh, the, the slow reopening, I think, especially when the weather gets better, is going to exacerbate this problem. And I really think that there's, there's a way of doing this safely and understanding that, yeah, you know what? I want to go to a patio and drink a beer. But I also want mm-hmm. schools to open right? Because a patio mm-hmm. is going to be open before schools is not a bad thing. It's just, the, it's two things that are independent happening at the same time. And this has been what yeah. has been really uh, affecting our discussion. This is a really good point. Like uh, there's so many things there, like even the idea that I, I actually find that people even often judge you if you don't fe- seem fearful in a conversation of COVID. Do you know what I mean? Like if you're just like, you know, yeah, like well, you, if you have any even a positive slant on this, like saying that we'll get through it, what have you, like it's it's OK. Like there's still, there's even that judgment at that time, like it's even the, there's that level of moralization of being like, if you're not fearful, you're not respecting it. We can't we can't connect, man. Like there's something wrong with you. But um, so, but man, it's uh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, what so, are you gonna so say I, I mean, I, I think where that comes from at the end of the day is I, I don't think in the history of. Uh, of of you know our, the the human race have we had such a technological way of actually getting together? It's almost a kind of like a bully system. Whether it's Facebook, whether it's uh, Instagram, whether or not it's Twitter, we haven't had a way to actually connect on a global scale like that, where everything's out in the open the minute you press enter, right? And if we look at bullying in kids, if we look at, I mean, you know, this is a natural phenomenon. You're never going to get rid of it. You can learn how to cope with it. You can try to educate your public, but people are always going to gravitate towards that in this kind of context, in my opinion, because the natural way of doing things, which is talking to one another face to face, like we talked about earlier, it has, has, has essentially disappeared in a lot of areas of the world. I'm not saying that we should have, and we should have neglected the, the, the realities of the biological realities of COVID. But the reality is, as we move forward, I actually think we're going to get an unconscious decoupling of another sort of way, which is which is an unconscious way of kind of like being less tribal the more we get together when it's safer. I don't think we're going to consciously do it, but I think slowly as we start having those backyard barbecues, as we start having friends kind of over, we're going to be more tolerant. You're going to make me cry, man. Different- this is making me so happy. No, no, I'm, saying, I'm not I'm not trying to. Look, I watched a lot of Days of Our Lives when I was eight years old with it my made grandma. Me feel so good, but, but <laughs> I did. Uh, but 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 really, at the <laughs> at the end of the day, I'm I'm being honest, right? Like at the end of the day, I think we're gonna we're gonna be able to like get together. We're gonna talk. We're gonna we're gonna hear about different you know opinions. I mean, look at what happened in, with 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 adolescence and bullying and mental health when social media started. It exploded. Am I wrong? I don't know. I mean, For I'd sure. love to get a child psychologist child opinion on this because I, again, sure. I'm not a child psychologist, but, but I mean, I, I, you know, we see it in kids all the time. I have a, you know, a 10 to 12 and a 14 year old. I mean, social media becomes this bully pulpit. Right. And, and, and I, and again, the people who are doing it, I don't think are necessarily inherently kind of bad in any way. I just think it's a natural kind of phenomenon. And the more you actually get 10 kids to play together, you know what happens? They get into fights. But they figure, figure it, out. it out. They figure it out, and 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 um and and this is what I think we're going to start doing more and more. One one other thing I want to really quickly say, and that's what, what I want to see whether or not Suman has seen this also, because one of the things that I saw in the ICU, because I've been doing a lot of ICU, obviously, it's ninety nine percent of my practice. But one of the things that I've seen is I consciously told, I consciously tried all any learner that came through the ICU or even a colleague of mine. So let's say to say it was Quadro getting me hand over in the morning, right? I know he didn't do this, but it's not a bad thing, but it was kind of like, it was kind of like, uh, like, a, like a detective episode, the history and physical, if it was a COVID patient. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed this. I don't know if any oh, other totally. doctors did it. It was, totally. it, was, it, was, it was like, it was like this person went to this place and then they saw their grandma and it was, a, you know, they only stayed for about law, 10 minutes. Law and order, law and order all up in the mix. So, do, do, do. What, I, what I started doing about three months ago, about actually more about four or five months ago is I, I you know, and, it, and it's funny because we, I, I, you know, I, you know how I teach. I, I, I don't make anything too, too serious. I just kind of said, you know what? I don't care. Doesn't matter. You know, like I don't care. 
the, the <laughs> person is my patient. They have COVID. I, I like we don't go into like you know I'm not I'm not public health in the context of trying to figure out you know tracing. That, that isn't my job in the ICU. It's to, it's to take care of the ventilator. It's to take care of the patient, uh, you know, and, and their interactions. I mean, it's to treat the patient. I didn't want a law and order, right? I didn't need that, right? It, it, if it was going to make a difference to somebody else, yes. But my point is, yes, okay, I wanted the, the, the you know, the, the two sentence, but I didn't want the two paragraph kind of who went where and what went where. So know. true. It, there was always an air of judgment or whatever. Yes. Got it from his daughter. Got it from his daughter. Yeah. OK, who came home early from college, like, you know, there's this huge judgmental thing in in the history. I'm like, I literally this doesn't affect management one iota zero. But it does okay. affect, you know what it did affect, though, and, and, and we've seen it. What it does affect is the guilt that some people yeah. actually do feel if there's bad outcomes. And I think a lot of us have seen that. And that's that's actually quite sad um, that, because. Yeah, because Nobody, nobody before, if somebody passed away, unfortunately, because of some type of other respiratory virus that I've seen in my 20 year career has worn it on their sleeve because they've never, they've never associated the two, even though it was obviously there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's that, that that's part. A, that's a big grief full. problem for a lot of these uh, families. I mean, this is part of the, I mean, almost part of the thing why I was uh, anti talking about it so much was like let's stop putting so much attention to it it's like not not necessarily that that will make a difference but knowing that the daughter gave it to this to the dad you know just that i just i don't know just hearing it constantly is like that energy is going to come through in our conversations with that daughter and that family member and it's just they they, they're going to feel guilty enough as is like we don't need to be part of that i i just but it's it that was definitely a hard part. Uh, many hard parts in the in the pandemic, but that was definitely one of them to to see that like complicated grief for sure. Um, I'm cognizant of the time, boy. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try and go with some hit, like quick hitter questions for for people. Um, this one's I'll, I'll I'll do this one real quick uh, with Suman. You think there's gonna be a fourth wave? There will be a fourth wave, but it's going to be fundamentally different because, yes, there will be a natural rise in cases, but with vaccination protection, what we care about is uh, cases that are admitted to hospital, cases and hospitalizations are continuing to decouple. So we're not going to see the same type of rush of hospital uh, admissions. And I think the main answer to the question that everyone's asking, will we have to lock down again? My prediction and based on the evidence that we have in front of me, I don't think we'll ever have to lock down again. Yeah, um, if we if we stick with the data and and the decoupling, I personally agree with that wholeheartedly. So um, what what I'm gonna I, I don't know if you well maybe you don't want my answer. That's okay because no. I don't think you will. No 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 no. Let's I'm being it. serious. Like I, so I think I'm gonna be I'm gonna be intellectually honest with 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 myself as a, as an ICU physician. Although I read up a lot on it, I have my own opinions. I think publicly, my honest answer is gonna be I don't know, right? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna defer to, you know, uh, infectious disease, epidemiology, you know, viral ph- phylogenetics, people who kind of study this, a lot of them are going to be wrong. Some of them are going to be right. I want the conversation from my standpoint, because of what I see in the ICU, as long as we're making decisions based on our value system and some data that we accept risk and that we understand, you know, there's a, there's a saying there's a saying in medicine, the surgery went great, but the patient died, Yeah. right? There's a reason yeah. for that, right? If you focus on, on the problem too, too much, I think you, you lose sight of some other things. And I think we need to start paying attention to those other things also. Stay broad, stay holistic. You know what I mean? Um, I hear you, but sometimes we just... Sometimes uh, we just want to hear your opinion. We we like you know what I mean. We know. Oh, like, I know. None of us. None of us are like I don't know. Like that's a re- that's the true answer for all of us. None of us know. That's true. But like this is our best educated guess is what we're doing. Um, this one, whoever answers it first. Do you think as uh, teachers get fully vaccinated, do you think there'll still be restrictions for our kids? like in schools, like, I guess what they're saying is like, are we going to still mask? Are we still going to have pe- plexiglass and so forth? Can I, uh, let me start uh, with this one, Tom. 
Uh, you know what? I, 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 you can start with it, but I definitely want a piece okay. of this one also, right? Because I think it's important. I, I agree. So, um, so I'll, I'll say that um, one thing we do know uh, based on transmission patterns, nobody's saying that there's zero transmission among kids. But the thing is that the if you look at the data from Israel, from UK, from the US, as cases in adults drop, for vaccination, you see a reflexive drop in, in uh, adolescents and kids. The reason is obvious is because m- the majority of transmission is happening in that in, uni- unidirectionally. So I think that once the teachers are protected, um, uh, there really is no reason for us to mask kids, except that we, we have to, again, trade-offs. We have to remember that kids haven't gotten a lot of viral infections this year, and that's not a good thing. Um, you know, viral infections are what te- what adds books to the kids' libraries for their, for their immune system. I know it's, it's been convenient as a, as a dad. I haven't had to deal with runny noses and coughs for a year. But that's not a good thing. So let's remember that. And I, I think that um, uh, kids being in class with masks all day is not going to be a good thing. So I, I'll, I'll echo that. I, I strongly believe that uh, once uh, people are offered their second uh, vaccine and, and uh, we're going to continue to see very high efficacy, uh, real world clinical efficacy uh, of these vaccinations, uh, vaccines, which are incredible. I think that uh, school should go back to, you know, 99% normal or 100% normal. Uh, well, the reason why I say that is because I think that there's a huge benefit developmentally for kids. I say that with a very cognizant uh, understanding that there's 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 workplace issues that I think have been brought up in Ontario, and I think that that, that I'm very cognizant of that. But I think that you know I'm basically saying from a perspective of how important educators are for our, our children, right? I'm actually I'm actually thinking about it in a different paradigm here, which is you know educators are essential workers in like really essential. When I mean essential, I mean, fundamentally, I've always said this. I've said that other than my children's parents, like myself and Julie, the teachers and coaches have been the most fundamentally important people in my children's life. 100%. I don't think you'll ever find a clip of me saying any different. And so I think just like nurses and hospital staff, and physicians are essential and, you know, people in grocery stores who are are working are essential to the functioning of our society. I think face-to-face learning is essential to our society. I'm very cognizant of the issues that are involved, but I think that once you get two vaccines, you know, I think that, you know, you know, I I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a situation where we, again, it's a a risk benefit trade-off. Yeah. And I well said with you a hundred percent well said uh, essential service. Um I'm gonna answer the quick this one real quick myself. Can you please discuss children's playgrounds? Is it low risk to take my two year old to the park and not walk oh. down the swing slides, etc.? Yes, yes, it's extremely <laughs> low risk. Extremely low risk. Um I don't think there's anything. The one thing I will say is like the fomite transmission argument like on surfaces uh is the latest i've read on that is that is uh essentially not a a, a contributor when it comes to covid really remember as as dr chakrabarty said sustained indoor uh uh, high inoculum uh, exposure you know a lot of times what you'll see the, the rebuttal to that is uh well what are we what do we have to lose yeah. And, uh, and 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 I think the I think I think the I uh, the rebuttal to that rebuttal for me is I'll give you an example of you know my my my, my kids playing you know uh, you know baseball for example right you couldn't get them more spaced out and you know the, 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 they they did a phenomenal job right and uh, the organization did a phenomenal job but at the end of the day we were so focused as a society early on last year in the summer on you know hand hygiene that when you took all these people all these these nine kids that are like super spread out right you basically brought them through the dugout so that they can all hand sanitize so just figure this out right and then they all come in and they're all like two feet away from each other of course they're they're not i don't think they're going to get covid based on two feet but my point is is that the human brain in my opinion psychologically i think we can only handle so much kind of like protective mechanisms right and i think if we focus on what's really really important doesn't mean to say that fomite can't can't give you like one out of a thousand, you know, two out of 10,000 kind of risk. But at the end of the day, 
it's an it, it, it's it's a it's a breathing thing, right? And and I think if we focus our efforts on that, I think also industrially and workplace, I think if we focus on that rather than hand sanitizing stations and you can't sit here, you know those kind of things where they they they, they sanitize the, the the chair that yeah, you just yeah. sat on. You know, th- those are the things that, 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 that they're hygiene theater that, you know, sanitizing a chair, like I'm sitting down with my, with, with my pants on, like, I'm not going to give you COVID if you sit on it afterwards. I ain't kissing your ass. <laughs> I was, I was, I was thinking but, exactly. but you understand what, but you understand yeah. what I mean, right? Totally. I think we should yeah. focus on things that matter. No, there, totally, there, man. There's a lot of negative consequences. There's like, it just, it's a deterrent as, or sorry, it's, it's like a distractor There's um, you know, like it increases anxiety, it reduces connection. And I, I I have no data to back this up, but I still, I'm going to say this relatively confidently. I do still think I, I get anxious about resistant organisms by the, with the amount of, of uh, hand sanitizer. Well, well Suman, hand sanitizer. I think you asked somebody one day, I think, I don't know if it was on some platform, what is deep yeah. cleaning? So yesterday, okay, so yesterday I had to go get, um, uh, you know, I had to go get some ice cream and, and a few things for, for one of my kids. And I still, I, I went to, uh, I went to the grocery store and I actually, I actually knew, knew the, 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 the guy, we didn't recognize each other because of masks and everything like that. But I think I, anyways, I, I put the, I, before I put my groceries on, you're right. right? I, and this guy was a phenomenal guy. I, I just remember him from high school, but he cleaned that kind of conveyor belt, uh, like, like nobody's business. It was about 30 seconds of <laughs> continuous scrubbing That's a long time. That's and I, time. I was, I was almost going to say, that's it. I'm going to, I'm going to steal this ice cream and, and I'll, 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 I'll figure it out afterwards. That's how long it took. So that was deep that, cleaning. Right, right there. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. 30 seconds of conveyor belt <laughs> cleaning. <laughs> yeah. That's a, whatever that's a that area level, is. For real. Yeah. The travel question and quarantine Basically, that's evolving. But the latest I read about that is, if you're you're double vaccinated, you could come back to the country, get a get a vax, get a test, COVID test, and um, then you don't have to quarantine. So uh, I think this will further evolve, and hopefully, even we might eliminate the test. So Quadro, I think what I think what the government's going to try and do in July is basically you get a test before you leave. You get a before, test before yeah. you leave. Too. Yeah, okay. you get a test. You get it double vaccinated. You get a test before you leave. You get a PCR test, and you self isolate at home, not in a hotel, while you get your test result back. If it's positive, you're out right away. In other words, you 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 may, that that's the proposal that's uh, coming around in July. I don't know if Suman, if you well, it, and I'll give you guys a bit of food for thought. Having done contact tracing now for the past year, the um, incubation period of classic as well as variant COVID is about three to five days. It's very quick. Yet we still do 14-day isolations for people. We That's the original data from China from March or no, whatever, February 2020. We still haven't changed that. 99 or 98 or 99 percent of infections happen within seven days yet we still do 14 days of isolation of a of a quarantine so it's uh it doesn't make sense that's what we talked about trade-offs that that that's that's trade-offs huge right? trade-off there was some push there was i thought there was was it alberta i can't remember there was some push for one place to be 10 days yeah. until uh until, until the variant alberta, uh, right. b117 yeah um um here's a good one i think this is one we can end with uh i'm just going to quickly peruse it to make sure it's a, the best one yeah definitely um should it be necessary for our students to get vaccinated to attend school oh my god oh my god <laughs> i gotta ask this one i'm never today. talking to you again guajo absolutely not um so so first of all if people can get vaccinated, get vaccinated. But uh, this is something that I was actually afraid of. I think that um, the tying vaccination for kids to go back to school, I think, is the absolute wrong move. I think that, um, you know, with uh, especially with, you know, with, with teachers vaccinated, um, you know, uh, being able to go into a situation, we, we have overall low COVID transmission, which we will have with uh, uh, widespread uh, vaccination of adults. I think, first of all, it's just not necessary. It puts another obstacle in for doing in-person learning, which for the reasons that uh, uh, Tom mentioned about uh, a couple of minutes ago is so important. And the other thing is, is that 
you know, from the global equity standpoint, we've talked about this before too, is that um, I think it's, you know, at some point we do need to vaccinate kids. And I think I'm very pro vaccine right now, though, if we get benefit of protection of kids, by vaccinating adults, I really also hope that we're getting a good chunk of vaccines and sending it to the developing world. We are, we are doing it in Canada. We are, we are doing it. I, so I don't want to say that we're not, but I think that should be the priority right now. Canada, we have extra vaccines, so we are vaccinating adolescents, but to tie that into school return, I think that's you know, not the right move. So, so I'll, yeah, so I agree with Suman. I uh, both, I have three children, two of my children that are of, uh, you know, full disclosure, two of my children that are of age uh, for the, you know, Health Canada approved Pfizer have received uh, a vaccination. Um, and so I'm very pro vaccine. Um, but but that is a different question. The, the question is, that was a very personal decision for us as parents. Um, you know, my kids are vaccinated for absolutely everything. Uh, I've I been vaccinated for, you know, everything. Uh, but I also think that we have a bit of a crystal ball here. Um, and uh, I'll leave it up to the ethicists to talk about, you know, those kind of things. But we do have a crystal ball in Israel where they have, you know, is it 58 or 60 percent of their 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 total population? They have a very large young population in Israel. So that's why it seems, you know, why, why can't they vaccinate more? But there's about 60, 61 percent, somewhere around there, fully vaccinated, 58 to 61 percent, fully vaccinated. And what you see is it's driven down the, 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 the case rate in a population of nine to 10 million people uh, to single digit numbers per day. That includes everybody. Right. And there's, you know, and that this is before any vaccines were available to adolescents. Um, so we have a bit of a crystal ball there. So, so, um, and I do think that uh, vaccines are I- incredible at, at at reducing clinically important disease in adults. Um, and 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 I think vaccine equity throughout the world is is you know is another thing to 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 to, to consider. Obviously, in a huge uh, in a huge way. Yeah, in, in true quadcast fashion. Hell no is my answer. You know what I'm saying? Good one. Yeah. If I, I'm not going to say anything new for more. You guys busted out. But like for it to be, a, it's it's just not logical for it to be a, a rate limiting step to for, for schools, you know, to make it mandatory. No, nothing else is mandatory from vaccines. There's a reason. But, you know, it's yeah, I, I just think uh, we, we have real da- real world data, a.k.a. a crystal ball to be able to determine these things. Listen, gentlemen, as usual, you guys threw down one of a, I'm going to call it a classic quadcast, throwing down knowledge, throwing down perspective, nuance. Nuance. That's the other thing I want to say, nuance discussion. So that, you know what I'm saying? So that you get like quadcast nation. So this is what we need to have to be able to navigate through these things. Not these... 14 second sound bites, but it really have an authentic discussions on what, what the pros and the cons of our actions are. And this is how we get through this. And I, I hope you guys got a lot from this. I know I did. And I, I, I feel indebted as usual. Dr. Tom Sarris, Dr. Sumar Chakrabarty, man, this was killer. Thank you so much for doing this. Once again, if you put in news in the, in the, in the text box, you'll get a, a copy of this solving wellness. SW trying to change that boogie yo honestly love you guys for listening in and we're going to continue to put out all this uh, hopefully you feel like it's awesome content uh, so we can get through this bad boy but thanks so much for listening guys take care guys take care guys